So, hello everyone. Welcome to the chat about the evolution of humans in the next century and the possible arrival of super intelligence. Um, my name is Peter Shramek. I'm AI visionary and entrepreneur with special focus on innovation ecosystems. Let me introduce uh, Rosa Castro. Uh, Rosa is a senior policy officer at the Federation of European Academies of Medicine. And she created of research and managed projects in areas of intersection of science and health policy, including intellectual property law and the biosciences. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Peter Shenasi. Peter is an international expert, energy expert, and founder of EPDO, a private company focusing on the latest available technologies in energy and ICT, and seeking new opportunities and projects for smart environmental technologies for energy efficiency, emissions reductions, the environmental impact of self-driving vehicles, the Internet of Things applications for energy sector, or hydrogen as an alternative energy source. And welcome, Mr. Karl Janacek. Uh, Karl is a Czech mathematician, visionary, and author of voting system D21, so-called the Janacek method. He started the firm RSJ Algorithmic Trading, which has become the biggest market maker in derivatives exchange worldwide. He founded a few endowment funds, like the Anti-Corruption Endowment Fund, Neuron Fund for Support Science and Research, Endowment Fund for Help for People Suffering from Irrational Bureaucracy, and Karol Janacek Endowment Fund Supporting Education and Civic Society <coughs> Activities. And I would like to uh, also invite you, uh, conference participants and possible online listeners, to enter uh, your questions uh, in our uh, Slido applications regarding our interesting topic. Um, and we have also a poll inside the application, so if you switch to the next step in the application, so you can vote, so you can read the questions, you will understand the question more after we start our discussions. And at the end, we will answer your questions and uh, uh, show you the results of this poll. So, the name of our chat is inspired by the book of the University of Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom, who defines superintelligence as any intellect that greatly exceeds the cognitive performance of humans in virtually all domains of interest. So my first, questions, my first question is, what is your definition or understanding of superintelligence? So, uh, would you like to start? Okay, sure. Um, <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks to, so much for your question, and thanks also to the organizers for inviting me to this chat. Um, I have to start, actually, by challenging a little bit that definition. Uh, I think because of two reasons. The first is that it assumes that we are kind of uh, in a race between humans and machines, in a... In a rather simplistic way, and I think it also assumes that while AI will evolve a certain intelligence, human intelligence might not evolve at the same time. Now, uh, I would like to like, take you a little bit away from the discussion on superintelligence and tell you a little bit about other technologies that are happening and that I think interact a lot with AI. And uh, you might remember that in 2014, there was the uh, World Cup took place in, in Brazil. Um, maybe you won't remember something that was a quite remarkable uh, thing that happened in the opening ceremony. And the fact is that a young man that was a former player and that has suffered an accident, a car accident, and was paraplegic, was the one that kicked the first uh, ball and opened the, the, the World Cup. How was this possible? Well, actually, the, the person was wearing a, a cap in his head, a little bit bigger than what I'm wearing right now. Uh, it's called uh, a device called EEG, electroencephalogram. 
It's a cap that goes into, into the, the scalp, into the head, and basically receives the signals from the brain. So neurons, every time that we are thinking or speaking or doing some brain activity, are transmitting electrical signs, signals. And this EEG device reads those signals and connected to an exoskeleton that the person had, sort of Iron Man exoskeleton, uh, robotic device. And it connected and it sent the signal from the, the person's brain into the exoskeleton, allowing this person to move the legs when they, he couldn't move the legs because he was paraplegic. So this is a quite remarkable um, uh, event, I think, but it's also happening in, in many different areas. Not only researchers are doing this, consumers are buying this type of new <coughs> devices uh, without a medical purpose. They are doing it for meditation purposes because they want to enhance their cognitive abilities, because they want to have more memory, or even though this is not proof yet, uh, this field is quite active. At the same time, very recently, DARPA, which is the U.S. Defense Ag um, Agency for uh, Advanced Research, just funded and launched a very big program on developing brain-machine interfaces that will allow military personnel to uh, command drones and other vehicles. And they plan to do this by connecting this type of EEG devices and other devices into all sorts of machines. Oh, thank you. So, Peter, what's your take about the definition of superintelligence? So, hello. Um, also, thank you for, for this wonderful panel, for the organization of the event. Um, when I thought of a concrete thing, what uh, is let's say back in the past, what was super intelligence for me was a maybe calculator. Yeah, this was, this was many decades ago. I think, of course, these, these things transform. Um, today, for me, su super intelligence, you find practically in every, every different field. I think the biggest challenge is to combine the, the different fields, cross industry application, um, create these super networks. I, I definitely will talk about energy because energy is something that I find that not only um, we would like to have super intelligent uh, electric grids, but with the climate challenge, uh, we have no other way than to, than to um, innovate some 21st century calculator that, that would optimize um, based on our behavior, way how we want to generate the electricity, how we want to um, use the electricity, how I want to share the energy between each other, how to make sure that we get the electricity not where we want it, but when the grid and the climate uh, allows us to, to take the electricity. So, so for me, uh, Peter, it, it uh, super intelligence it's much more let's say sector oriented and much more let's say practical uh, oriented why do I need the super intelligence uh, for for me for, for my industry no, thank you and Carl what about you I see uh, uh, good afternoon and thanks for the invitation for the opportunity to speak here uh, to me, uh, super intelligence is, uh, is a connection. It is a connection of uh, general AI, general artificial intelligence, and human intelligence. Uh, I believe that um, AI can never reach the level of super intelligence. AI is something that does not have motivation. What is AI, in fact? AI, AI is very smart data crunching. You have smart algorithms, you have huge data, and you do the results. The computations, the algorithms are so com complicated that nothing can be predicted that you really have to do the calculation to see the result. But nevertheless, AI it doesn't have the motivation. So the only way to get to the next level uh, is to connect human brain, human motivation, human emotions with AI. And we already start to have technologies for that. So. Um, 
so that would be the first level of super intelligence if we imagine people as having um, a device and being able to to see all data being able to po to uh, answer questions through through uh, internet etc online and think and have motivation to that that's the first level and the second level of uh, super intelligence we could imagine as uh, actually a connection a connection of, um, if not all, but uh, most or many human brains that, that want to be connected, that want to be online. And then we can imagine like a formation of, of one, uh, one uh, being, of one entity, which would be Earth intelligence, uh, humans that are connected online, that communicate in different ways, uh, not just words, but through uh, different devices, connected to the internet, connected to this huge amount of information. And that, to me, is, is the total revolution, is, is, the, is a jump uh, to, to next dimension and uh, to next level of existence. I call this, by the way, social singularity uh, 21. Oh, thank you. So uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, different uh, thoughts about uh, what uh, super, super intelligence actually is. But the question is, uh, when it will arrive? So the, my next question is um, uh, motivated by the uh, survey conducted by Max Techmark's Future of Life Institute, uh, where they asked the, around 15,000 participants to answer the question, when the AGI will surpass the human level? So this is exactly the same question as is uh, on poll. So I will not uh, give you the, the result of this survey. So I will show it. Uh, I will give you it on the end, the very end. But I'll ask uh, the panel participants what their uh, opinion on when the AGI or the super intelligence uh, will surpass human level. So. Would you like uh, me to start? Yeah, can you start? <laughs> okay, I can basically, uh, it might be a bit disappointing, but I think I don't really know the answer to that question. Uh, I think you will give the answer then to the results of the survey, but I think the fact that a lot of AI experts have not agreed on the, you know, that point in time in which super, super intelligence will happen means that we don't know enough now. If the definition of superintelligence is more on the line of my colleague, uh, co-panelists here, then I would tend to agree that then we could have more data or a model that the experts could generate to make some estimate that is more reliable. Um, saying that, I would just like to add something else, which is the fact that we do have frameworks for policymakers, for experts, to understand type of risks, because pe many people talk about uh, superintelligence as a sort of catastrophic risk, or, um, um, and we do have a framework to think about this type of risks. And in fact, people, uh, experts tend to define a risk as the combined probability that some event will happen with the harm that this event will cause. And we face risk every day of our lives, when we take the car, when we take a shower, when we go out to the street to walk. Um, I would like to highlight two things that we don't know really about risk and why we are very bad actually at, at estimating risk. The first is that for risk that we actually can estimate, well, the experts can estimate, the insurance company can very well estimate the risk that I will be involved in a car crash, for instance. They are actually offering me insurance against that. Policymakers also use to calculate this risk in many types of regulations. Nevertheless, the researchers have shown that people are really bad at rationally estimating the risk. So a lot of us will, you know, fear uh, getting into the plane much more than getting into our cars, whereas the data is showing us that we should fear the, the, the car much more. And uh, a heavy smoker might be, you know, very afraid about Ebola outbreak, but the probability is much higher that he will suffer or she will suffer from a disease that is related to <coughs> this person being a heavy smoker. Uh, so that's the first fact. We are not uh, thinking rationally about risk. And the second fact is that there are some risks that people tend to call, to call uncertainties rather than risks, because we just don't know enough and the experts don't know enough to model. 
And if we're talking about things such as uh, superintelligence, I think we are entering into that landscape. Thank you. So, for that. Peter. Um, for me, um, maybe I start differently. I, I mentioned climate. Um, I, I think, uh, just to give you an idea, because as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not about climate itself, it's about CO2 and the largest pollutant or generator of CO2 is energy, transportation, residential houses, practically these three areas. We, we, ex we expect, or let's say, the temperature rise that we experience, or that we, uh, that we are right now, the CO2 in the atmosphere, it's about the same, uh, same situation at about three million years ago. At that time, was all the temperature rise about three degrees, and the sea levels were higher, about 10 to 20 meters, which means practically parts of London were flooded, New York didn't exist, Shanghai didn't exist, uh, Bangladesh also didn't exist. So I, in, why, I, why I say this, um, as I mentioned, my, my sector is one of the, one of the largest, uh, largely responsible for, for the situation, and we have, we have to take some decisions in, in energy. How, how, to, how to approach in the years to come, because as the United Nations is saying, if we do nothing or if we do not do significant changes, then the temperature will not rise to two, two to three degrees, but three to five degrees by, by, um, by, 2000, by 2100 year. So, so practically, uh, we really need super intelligence, and, and we cannot wait till 2100 because in 2100, uh, we probably will not be here, but probably our children will not be so happy about the situation. So, so Peter, uh, it is not the question when will happen. We, in terms of the um, maybe medical, maybe entertainment, maybe real estate, we probably can wait. Yeah, these are the areas that are not so hot. In climate and energy, uh, I would like that in 10 years, we have this, we have a slightly different situation than today when we expect the, the guy to come and take the number on our electrometers once a year, which tells us completely nothing about the way we use energy and where we can save energy. Thank you. Carol, please. I believe that the question about uh, time uh, is actually not well posed. Um, why? Well, I argue that, uh, that AR or uh, general artificial intelligence can never surpass uh, human intelligence in all aspects. Uh, there is not the motivation, I can see some disagreement with it, but there is no motivation what AI does. AI is just a big calculation of a huge amount of data. So uh, the way to go is to connect the human intelligence with AI, and then, um, then actually, uh, once we do that, then we already did surpass the, the human intelligence by just by using technologies. In fact, we are already doing that. We are already partially uh, using these devices. We are already on the way. So it's a continuous process towards the future. And uh, we could ask a question, when will it be so significant that, uh, that our lives will change dramatically uh, using AI in our lives? And yeah, I believe that actually the time is coming quite soon. It may be a few years, it may be 12 years. Uh, uh, however, the process, uh, I think, will be gradual. It's, in fact, we won't even notice it. Uh, our lives will be changing. And if you imagine the life uh, 25 years ago with our internet, it was very different. So, so this, this will progress. Maybe, maybe the evolution will progress even more rapidly than, uh, than now. Okay, so, so you basically believe that uh, the super intelligence can uh, arrive uh, uh, through the humans augmented by this kind yes, of a exactly. technology. So some, exactly. some individual can uh, at, uh, happen at some point of time in the, in the close future, which will have a superhuman abilities in all of the fields of human, human knowledge, Indeed. thanks to this 
uh, technology Indeed. And, and this technology, it's not just about information. It is, in fact, about technology we can transmit, transmit more than words. So uh, we can have technology that transmit emotions. So even communication uh, among people can be on a new, completely new level, not just the words, but uh, emotions and all, all the information together. Uh, so when it happened, so how we can uh, prevent uh, the, some potential danger, dangers coming from this kind of a super intelligence, super intelligent capabilities of machine or human? So uh, what what do you think? What could be the right strategy with, let's say, special mm -hmm. focus on European Union? Yeah. So, um, I would like to start by uh, reflecting on one point. I'm very glad that you brought uh, the climate change issue uh, into the conversation because uh, precisely I think that the, this issue is not the only one we are facing and it's probably not the worst one we are facing. So, I think that to reflect on the potential dangers, the potential threats, especially to the EU, we need to think broader in this sense. And we need to take into account that there are other risks out there and to take a sort of uh, um, risk risk straight off approach, which means that one of the risks can contribute and, or could save us. I mean, we could imagine that AI will save us from the effects of climate change or would help us cope with these effects or it could worsen them. So we need to bring these like, sort of broader issues into the conversation. Um, a second aspect that I wanted to reflect on is, is the fact that, uh, you know, in a world with in unlimited resources, this wouldn't matter that much to bring, you know, silo conversations. But the fact is that we are in a world that has very limited resources. People have only limited time, limited budgets, and, and we are competing for the attention of policy makers, of politicians out there. So all these issues uh, need to be put into context, and I think we need to take into account the fact that we are facing other catastrophic risks, such as an asteroid hitting the Earth and, uh, and other threats to human existence. I tend to agree with uh, Karel on the point that I don't see uh, superintelligence as something that could happen uh, in the sense of machines surpassing human intelligence, but more of an integration between human intelligence and machines. Um, and I would like to cite, just to finish, um, uh, this, uh, this point. A, a recent report that was written in the, by the Center for European Policy Studies, a task force on AI, that, uh, you know, gathered together some experts and they concluded that nothing in current AI uh, applications uh, point out to the fact that uh, a general artificial intelligence is going to happen soon. They moreover reflect on the fact that most of the current AI applications, and th this may be a little bit different from what you just said, uh, that the current AI applications that we use are nothing as human intelligence as we usually think about human intelligence, awareness, and... Yes. Oh, you tend to agree with that. <laughs> so, again, and this goes back to the other question, when, but also, what should we worry about? Now, in the light of limited resources and time and attention of the politicians, I think we should probably focus on both the dangers but also the potential benefits right now. So basically, the first question is, what are the potential benefits? In the medical sector, there are many. I mean, there are AI applications that work together with humans to develop better and more precise diagnosis of diseases, uh, surgical interventions that uh, avoid some human errors. The questions right now is, who is going to benefit from them? Who is going to have access to these new technologies that are being developed? Is the distribution going to be equal or is it going to worsen inequalities out there? So EU needs to worry about many of the things that a panel discussed yesterday, you know, how EU can remain competitive, how can uh, they develop uh, the research that is needed, how can they embed the values into the regulatory framework that will help to develop the technologies without threatening uh, other values, other competing values. And on, we need to think about the risks and the dangers also by thinking about the potential benefits. Thank you. Peter, what's your... Maybe I, I uh, know one, I'm looking at the questions, the one brought the film Terminator, the machines against humans. Um, I just showed the film to my son, 
to teach him some some old some old uh, cult cult films. I, I I really hope that that um, um, it will not come to that 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 the machines take over. That that o of course we have examples. We have examples. Recently, I'm sure you will encounter troubles traveling. The I think Boeing is I'm sure studying their software systems. Uh, the, the the struggle of the pilots uh, managing the, the the software on the plane uh, sometimes more successfully, sometimes less successfully. So we we really don't want to see this. Um, and I I am not an IT. Um, let's say, expert to say how, how big is the danger uh, of, of the machines, uh, the virus. Of course, I, I do come from the energy sector. We do, we do run six nuclear power plants in Czech Republic. We really don't want the nuclear power plants to be in some way affected by, by, by the risk of the, the, the AI super intelligence, uh, let's say, being... being Putting, putting us in danger. But maybe I, I come back to my early discussion uh, when I said the, the potential risk of the, of the um, climate. Uh, I read some study which, which assumed if all these things happen, which I mentioned the cities, the bill was $600 trillion to clean up the environment. So, so for me, the, the, the challenge is let's put some of this money which probably we are on a very good track to, 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 to spend some of that money in, two, in 2100. Let's spend some of the money on investing into, into programs where, where artificial intelligence and these intelligent uh, uh, networks could, could, could improve uh, our work with energy, and, uh, with energy efficiency. So I would put it in a different way. What's, what's the budget? that we are willing to put in now to, to basically, in my sector, to save, to save the situation that will come. And it is quite clear that, that with the Paris Agreement, even with all the measures, will not achieve two degrees. So, so let's spend some of the money from the, the bill in the future on an on a, on a AI and uh, intelligent uh, uh, networks now. Thank you. So, Carol, what's your uh, recommendation for strategy uh, especially for European Union to prevent dangers coming from mm -hmm. super intelligence? Um, AI, even general AI, does not have motivation. It is a tool. It is a tool uh, how uh, other tools that we have, except that it's extremely advanced, extremely smart. And uh, there is certainly a danger. There is a danger if uh, there is a group of people who want to do things which are not in line with human values, who want to overtake the world or uh, maybe some countries, uh, we can imagine, some countries who would like to control. So if there is uh, some group like that who has the first uh, very smart general AI and pushes the button, then it could be dangerous. So, so it is a dangerous tool. How do we, uh, how do we uh, prevent that from happening? How do we make it that we get the advantages that, uh, the, that AI helps humans? Uh, I believe that what is important that it is to do the research, work on it, work on it in democratic countries in European Union as well, and um, and implement uh, correct smart algorithm into the AI, some axioms. And I have been uh, looking into that a little bit. You can look if you want on values21.org, uh, values I call it orthogonal values, which is which is a set of uh, uh, words, uh, values, uh, notions uh, that that are entirely positive and whose ambition is uh, to be orthogonal, meaning that the meanings do not interest each other. So it's this uh, mathematically efficient expression, and also they are the ambition to be complete, not totally complete, but to be almost most complete in the, in the world what we want, what is, our, what, what is our value, what are our values, what are our desires. So if we um, implement a smart axioms like that into an artificial intelligence and we are fast enough, then we can make sure that, uh, that artificial intelligence will not be abused. And in fact, uh, my, uh, my institute is, is in communication with other uh, uh, experts in AI how to, how to do uh, this process. 
So, uh, for European Union, indeed, it is uh, extremely important to be in the front of the research and also invest resources uh, and uh, things like that uh, in order to take the positive uh, side. Thank you. So, we have a, a lot of interesting questions here. Uh, so, maybe the first, uh, the most uh, uh, top one is, uh, the, could AI improve the quality of democracy and what governments must do for that. So uh, I believe that uh, you have some more uh, ideas about this one. Uh, uh, I, my answer would be yes. Uh, in, in general, I would say that AI can uh, vastly improve the quality of, of human living. We can uh, make our words uh, much more efficient. Uh, we, we have the technologies now, and, and it really, in, in principle, um, I, I would say that uh, the obstacle are uh, human communications now, uh, our uh, separation of society, it is, it is conflict, of course, ecology and things like that. But we, in principle, if we start to communicate well and uh, trust each other a little bit better, we can make the big jump. We can make the jump, the social singularity 21, where uh, even still without uh, super intelligence, we can uh, save our world in a very good way. So uh, with, with well-posed uh, axiom with artificial intelligence, uh, this uh, tool, this tool can greatly help us. It can greatly help uh, uh, democracy. It can greatly help uh, uh, human um, values and uh, uh, and freedom. Um, in fact. Um, we can even imagine uh, future scenarios of the world where uh, actually we could be at the next level of communication and existence. Maybe we will not be living in a, uh, by definition, democracy as it is now, uh, with, with parliament and stuff. It could be that people communicate much more directly. Uh, I'm not talking about a pro proponent of a direct democracy in that sense, but, but in a different level of management communication. So it could be, uh, we, I believe that we will converge, if we are successful, we will converge to D21. It's not a voting system, it's also a voting system, but D21 would be Democracy 21, new level of democracy, democracy for the 21st century. Uh, thank you. So the, uh, the next question is, uh, are we too dependable on technology? Could it be our downfall if superintelligence would exist? So, I don't know, if Peter or Rosa? Are we too dependent on technology? I think, again, it depends. If that technology is really helping us, is really benefiting us, is improving the systems, as uh, Carol just uh, reminded us, then we are not too dependent. I think we could even wish to be more dependent on technology, to let the technology do the boring stuff for us and uh, try to think about the task and the, uh, and the things that humans might, might want to focus on. There is an even a possible world in which we won't work and the machines will help us do the hard work and then, you know, we can imagine such things. But I think, I mean, the real question is, is, is this what we want? Are we having a broad conversation with all the, the, the people in, in the society to, to be able to, to bring different uh, set of values into, the, into that conversation and to try to find out whether the, you know, this is what should happen? Uh, I'm not so sure on that point. Uh, so the question of whether we are too dependable or not on technology really depends on the safety measures that we build into those technologies. So thinking about threat and cybersecurity and, and other type of threats, hacking of a system. Of course, nobody wants to be completely dependent on a system that if it fails because of a hacking, uh, everything will fail. Uh, on the other hand, if it's helping us to focus on other things that human uh, humans want to do more, then we should be dependable. Maybe just to connect, uh, when I go back to the 1970s and use the calculator, of course my, my mother, when she sees me using, let's say, technology or even my son, but she's saying, okay, this is, where is this going? I, I think in 20, 30 years, I think not only will be completely dependent on technology, but the technology will think what we should have for dinner tonight in order to optimize our dietary uh, habits. So I'm completely 100% sure that in, tw in 20, 30 years, 
will decide very little about about things, and the computers will will have such a let's say high um, high computing power that that will make most of the decisions for us. So uh, no doubt for me. Uh, for me, uh, I believe that yes, that there is a danger that uh, in the future we could become too dependent on technology in what sense? It, it, imagine that most people just want to go to virtual reality to live a completely different, uh, different lives than, than the real uh, world. It, the, it is a danger. I uh, don't think it will happen, but it is important to educate and to talk about these things, and it's important for people to be a big part of their time, really down to the earth, on the earth, to, to move, to do sports and uh, things like that that uh, always existed, not to be just in the virtual virtual world. But of course, uh, we don't want to uh, say we cannot do that. Yeah, we, we want to. We need to be able, as as advanced humans, to connect to make the connection between the earth and between the cloud. Thank you, uh, Carol. We have just uh, one more question, especially for you. It's uh, uh, if you think that AI can manipulate the financial markets, so do you believe that use of AI capabilities on financial markets may be misused? And please, short answer. Uh, I think that uh, in general, AI could be misused. Uh, we, uh, we talked about that. It's important to implement the right axioms, the, the values into AI algorithm, in which case it won't be abusing, uh, it won't be manipulating financial market. In principle, yes. If the first one who has the smartest, the, f f uh, the mm -hmm. most efficient AI is uh, the one who wants to abuse it, then there is a danger, but the danger is even, even deeper than just, than just manipulation of financial markets. Um. Thank you. So it's a time to look at our poll. So the question, when the AI surpassed the human level, uh, so the, 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 the most common answer is still 2050. 42% of, of you um, answered this, and 37% answered never. So it's, it's actually very close to the results of uh, Max Texmark's Future of Life Institute where 15,000 people answer it in the very similar way. So the most common answer was still 2050. And by the way, they answer it also that uh, mostly expect that it will be good, not bad for us. So I would like to thank you. I would like to thank you all these uh, panel, pa panel members. And um, 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 I have a direction that uh, the closing remarks and light uh, lunch will be served in the gallery, and uh, if you can move immediately at that place because uh, uh, it's starting right now. Thank you.